Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to take you through a few slides, and as Brian said, it's to provide you with some context for uh, this afternoon's presentation and, and discussion, which, of course, we're uh, hoping that you'll participate in, as you did this morning. Why performance? Uh, it's been a performance-based code for close to 20-odd years now, since 1996. So as a performance-based code, it has some distinguishing characteristics from that of just being a prescriptive code, which, of course, many people are familiar with through the deemed to satisfy provisions. But by being a performance-based code, the authors, the people who envisaged that performance-based uh, regulation was the way to go with building, were really envisaging that you needed the opportunity and the option of flexibility as much as you might prescription. And in fact, that, that was very insightful when you take into consideration the pace and rate of change that you're all experiencing and potentially will experience in the coming few years as a result of things like disruptive technology, changes to construction practices, etc. So if we look at this slide here and look at the, the middle word there, innovation, really the fathers of the building code and, and making it a performance-based code were contemplating that there would always be a need to ensure that innovation could be promoted and encouraged. And if you have a purely prescriptive type of regulatory environment, it's very difficult to be innovative in that experience. And some of the material that Graham touched on this morning, if you were here this morning, uh, in terms of the transformational projects, are about trying to better prepare the practitioners, the ABCB, the industry itself, with the sort of innovation that's coming around the corner or is here right now. Modular building construction just being one uh, example of that. So it's very important that we maintain an ability within the code writing process for industry and for practitioners, who I assume uh, make up the majority of people in the audience here, have that capability. And simply to say performance doesn't do justice to the type of uh, body of work, the, the integrity of the work and the complexity of the work that's involved in doing performance. And I think it's really important also to ensure that people don't walk away today with the view that the ABCB is trying to ram performance down everyone's throat, that it's somehow it's mandatory that you must do performance. That's not the purpose of this discussion. It's not the pur purpose of a performance-based code. Deemed to satisfy is an entirely legitimate option for people to use. And in many cases, particularly for, for instance with domestic housing, it will remain the primary means by which people will uh, assess the adequacy of their design and their construction. But increasingly, buildings are becoming more and more complex. Whereas in the past, it was about structural liability, fire integrity and a few other critical elements to do with health and safety of buildings, we've now got a lot of societal type of issues that also have to be factored in to construction, energy efficiency, disability access, to name a couple. And that's only going to increase. And of course, it's not just a case of accommodating all of those things. It's often a case of trying to uh, understand how do I adjust structural reliability to accommodate some of these other issues. So you're doing trade-offs and comparisons in all of that work. And that doesn't come easily with deemed to satisfy. And deemed to satisfy cannot keep up with the pace of change. You can't just quickly write prescriptive standards for everything that's happening. Someone wants something to happen tomorrow. They want to use a new technology, a new way of doing something. We can't suddenly turn around and write a DTS for it. You're going to be required and your client's going to ask for, on occasions, you to find innovative solutions to problems that are being thrown up by a raft of things. So what we're trying to do here is help prepare you, if you're not already, to use a performance-based code, understand some of the things we're going to do to help better equip you to, to deal with that, and uh, enable uh, not so much a transition, but more a balancing act between what has become customary practice around, well, we'll just always uh, uh, default to the DTS, as opposed to, well, maybe performance is a legitimate solution in a particular set of circumstances. So I mentioned 20 odd years ago, the performance-based code was introduced. But at this, uh, uh, over the last 20 years, we've seen falling productivity in Australia. 
and that's reflected in Productivity Commission reports, reports by KPMG, by McKinsey, by the OECD. And building doesn't have a stellar reputation in amongst all of that productivity decline. In fact, it's one of the worst performing areas in the national economy in terms of productivity uh, increase. Likewise, with the work that the ABCB has been doing, we asked the Centre for Inter International Economics about three years ago to undertake an analysis of regulatory reform in the building space and whether or not it had helped improve uh, productivity. They identified that uh, as a result of the changes to date, including a performance-based code, we'd probably added $1.1 billion of benefits to the national economy per annum. But what they went on to say was that there was a potential to add another $1.1 billion of, of uh, productivity benefit to the economy per annum, of which 70% could potentially be gained through better use of performance. So again, that gives the ABCB and national governments, that is the nine governments, an incentive to encourage and help people use performance in the appropriate circumstances. And we have uh, a new ABCB vision down the bottom there, which was introduced last year, called increased, well, the vision is increased productivity and improved building outcomes. So how can you achieve the increased productivity, maintain the health and safety standards of the code, and still achieve uh, effective building outcomes. And that was signed off by the board and the whole reform agenda that is going to be summarised today, particularly in the space of performance, was signed off by building ministers in 2014 as well. Uh, this is just the last slide in this context setting, but what it tries to do is encapsulate what we've witnessed with uh, performance versus DTS over the last 20 odd years. Most of you would be familiar up until 2016 with the pyramid that was in the code, which had functional statements, objectives, etc. And what became obvious to us through surveys and uh, other analysis was that many practitioners were seeing the entirety of the pyramid as everything that they had to do, that everything within it was a mandatory requirement, including the DTS. And that was skewing people's understanding and perception of a performance-based code because in fact the only mandatory requirements in the code are the performance requirements. The DTS are a means of demonstrating compliance with the performance requirements. Likewise, a performance solution is a means of demonstrating compliance with the code. So they're equivalent. And that's what this diagram, which is now in the NCC 2016 edition, represents. Your mandatory requirements up the top, the performance requirements, two pathways to achieving compliance. One, the deemed to satisfy solution or a performance solution or a combination of both. You'll note that we changed the word from alternative solution to performance solution because what we were also witnessing was that people saw the word alternative as describing a different way of doing something if you couldn't achieve the DTS. So it was almost causing people to think, ah, the DTS is what I have to achieve and the alternative is only in the circumstance when I can't achieve the DTS. So we've changed the language. It's a performance solution or a deemed to satisfy solution or a combination of the two. I think the other critical thing, and it'll come out both in the presentations and hopefully the discussion we have at the end, is that we acknowledge that the, the more you move towards performance, the harder it gets. It's a more rigorous process you require high le higher levels of competency. You may have to engage other practitioners, if you're a building surveyor, for instance, or an architect, to assist you in getting certain things signed off because you don't necessarily have the competency. That's not a criticism. These things are highly complex. Buildings are highly complex, particularly when you go beyond class one. So we understand that encouraging people to increase their use of performance because the world's changing and in many cases you might not have an alternative, it's going to require more rigour and more levels of competency as part of that process. So that's just by way of introduction and context for what's going on.